I'm sitting in the, it's after the flight now. So we're doing a little review after the flight about the Skyreach, that's the brand name. Bushcat is the name of this particular model. And some people might look at this and go, hey, I, I kind of know that airplane, what is that? We once knew it as the Cheetah. It's always come from South Africa. That's where it was designed uh, by a Russian individual, as I recall. And it has a very distinctive nose cowl that kind of makes everybody go, yep, I know that airplane because I know that particular thing. So we, things changed. The Skyreach company took it over. It became the Bushcat now. It's essentially the same airplane. So let's talk a little bit about how the airplane is made. First of all, this is what might, some people might call this a simple construction. I'm looking right up here above my head and there's a series of aluminum tubes, large diameter aluminum tubes held together with gusset plates. That's basically the construction of most of this airplane. The fabric covering the wings is basically a sailplane type fabric. I think this would be called Trilam, although there are different kinds of descriptions for the Dacron type fabric and there are different brands for it as well. So it's a Trilam like fabric. It's a very durable fabric. Some people, I heard someone come up and ask Daniela Knoll, she's one of the two principals in the US importer, Aerosport, how long will the fabric last? And I can tell you as an old hang glider pilot, this stuff will last really quite well. Of course, if you keep it out of the sun as much as possible, it's the sun that will cause any problems with it, just like with most kinds of fabric. But this will probably last many years before it would need to be replaced. But even if it does need to be replaced, it's a kind of a slip-on cover. It pulls over the wing, it laces down. There's a few places on the airplane where you can see some lacing, and that's what that's about. This is not a dope and fabric covered wing, which also means it doesn't have to be painted, which means it doesn't acquire the weight of painting, much less the cost, paint is not cheap, and much less the effort. It takes some time to do painting. It's almost an art form. So the basic construction of the airplane is very simple. I don't have the numbers in front of me now, but I know this to be a quite a light airplane, and you could tell that on its takeoff climb. With the 100 horsepower Rotax 912 ULS carbureted engine in this airplane, we were seeing uh, close to 1,000 feet on initial climb out, and even at reduced uh, power, uh, slightly reduced power, and at a higher airspeed to give lots of visibility over the nose, we were still seeing more than 500 feet a minute. So this airplane really wants to climb. As Jeremy mentioned about it, he's been able to achieve takeoffs in the 125 foot range. Factory says about 250 or thereabouts. Uh, and indeed, it got off the ground really quick. All that speaks to the lighter construction. Uh, welded steel is great. Uh, carbon fiber fuselages are pretty, but this basic construction is very solid for this kind of thing. You can see this thing over my shoulder here. I'm gonna pull it down now because this is the armrest but it's also where the throttle is. And that makes it, this is very easy, your arm just, some people say your arm goes naturally to a position. And most of the time I kind of roll my eyes at that comment, but in this one, it's right on the money because your hand comes down, it's right on the throttle. And in anywhere you have it, that throttle will still work. So if you don't want this, if you're cruising along and you don't want to move it, it's quite a stiff throttle. That's what keeps it in position. You can just swing it back up out of your way and not have a throttle in your way but it's always there right away when you pull down on it. So that's very convenient and easy. Uh, now let's talk about uh, instrumentation and also some what I call human factors, that is how the, uh, the people inside feel about the airplane. First of all, simple panel. Uh, there are three instruments here, or four instruments I'm pointing out. These are all MGL instrumentation that I'm seeing. Uh, they are showing, on this one over here, we saw altitude and rate of climb uh, depicted digitally on the small screen. I mentioned to Jeremy in flight that it takes a little bit of glancing at those to quickly acquire the information. That's true of digital with numbers versus a needle position, but it didn't take very long before I was finding the information very quickly. Over here we had uh, um, uh, temperature indications, uh, and as I said several times in flight, the uh, temperature on the uh, uh, installation just hardly ever moved. It was always in about the mid-170s, which is low and it hardly changed no matter whether we were climbing or had the throttle back or whatever we did. It, did, it just didn't want to go any higher than that. The bottom one does all the other instrument, uh, instruments like uh, temperatures uh, for each cylinder and it moved around a little bit and I didn't pick up on all of that right away because first of all the representation is a little smaller and also um, uh, there's more information there to pick up so you'll get that quickly in time. 
Uh, then of course they've got a radio right here in the center as well. Also very small instruments because you see the panel here. I've got fairly small hands and yet I can span the entire panel. And switches in the center of course we talked about those during the flight. They've got a nice mount over here. They put the iPad on it. Uh, they use the I, uh, Fly Q product out of Seattle Avionics with a representation of uh, uh, sectional charts and of course all your other information like ground speed and many many more things I'm sure that will do. That wasn't our focus but you can see here that's very easy for the pilot to see or for the occupant to see if you've just got a, a non-flying passenger with you. If you've got someone like a, a co-pilot with you uh, they could be operating this themselves very easily. Um, cockpit, the uh, seats are seats were comfortable. I found I wanted a little lum more lumbar support, but there's a way to deal with that. But the seats themselves are comfortable. They come well forward, uh, so your leg almost up to the uh, end of my knee there, and that means you have good support for a long time. I really didn't notice the seats much in flight. Center joystick it was a little stiff roll side. We talked about that during the flight. That's because it's just gone through a 50 hour uh, maintenance check and all the all that got tightened back up a little bit again in time that'll loosen up some and that's fine if it does uh, but he just did a tightening because that's what's called for in the spec and then on the front is the brake and that's one place where I would fault it but they are going to take it the brake you have to actually pump it to make it really do much otherwise it just sort of slows you down a little bit it doesn't really bring it to a stop uh, but they are going to be changing brake companies so they're they're aware of that themselves there is no parking brake feature on this particular brake arrangement uh, that will also be changing as they move forward with a new supplier for that product. Uh, all the I like the well, one thing I like here is the uh, magnetos. These are something that they're in the off position now and sometimes these hooded these are called hoods here and sometimes they are reversed the other way and they keep you from inadvertently switching something off and indeed they work that same way here too but when you switch them off and then you put them back on now that is going to push that back into the on position. So if these guards are up, that means the magnetos are hot. I'm going to put them back down and switch them off because we're not getting ready to fly here. Uh, back a little closer here, if the camera can see here, right, right below, there's an armrest in the center as well. That's that's convenient and easy, uh, and helps you when you're when you're manipulating the stick. You can have one arm, your uh, elbow is pinned down there. Uh, that's convenient and handy. So I kind of like that. But as I move that stuff away, on the left side over here, we have a choke lever. I'm not going to move it because I don't want to push any fuel into the engine. And on the other side is the trim here. You can see behind my hand. And uh, that, there's a little, there's little details. I can hear them now easily. They're kind of like you might find on a bicycle. And uh, I, in flight, I had a little trouble sensing that, but Jeremy noticed it. And indeed, after I fiddled with it a little bit, I could kind of tell that as well. Four-point seat belts. Um, Rudder pedals on both sides. Rudders are uh, very easy to move. And down here, I couldn't see this very well from my side. Of course, the pilot would see it very well. The fuel uh, selector uh, on-off switch. So one last thing inside the cockpit here. We'll come up and look at the flap handle. It's where either occupant can reach it quite easily. There's a detent button on the front. I'm going to pull it down and then pull that down. And that's full flaps now. And it, it stays in there. So you can pull the detent back. And then you can start moving it. And then you can let go of the detent. And you can see once it gets to the right spot, it doesn't click into position really, but it goes into position. And so now that's in the second spot. And back up, and I can push it all the way forward, and now the flaps are completely retracted. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that behind the seats here, there's a netted area, and that allows you to put some uh, a certain amount of luggage stuff. You couldn't carry a lot of luggage back there, uh, but enough stuff for a short flight or maybe an overnight bag, that kind of thing and you can reach it in flight. So in Bushcat, we're looking at one on uh, tricycle gear here. You can see that pretty easily. You can have it in tail dragger form as well. There's a lot of us that think tail draggers look pretty cool and are fun to fly, so if you can have it either way, your choice. But you can also have it as a amphibious airplane on amphibious floats with uh, retractable gear uh, for land and water use, of course. So the airplane is quite versatile that way. It's versatile in another way in that you can buy it as a special light sport aircraft ready to fly, as you see it here. And that means they can do an ELSA kit if they want, which has no percentage attached to it at all. It probably won't save you a lot, but it might be satisfying to some people who want to have more hands on to the airplane. We believe you can get it with a different engine too. And then at any rate, there are ways you can reduce this price quite a bit because you can also build it as an experimental amateur build. They are ready to supply a kit and the Aerosport folks up in Wisconsin 
do have a builder center to assist people who want to take that particular approach. That'll save you some money, that'll let you learn more about the airplane, and afterward you can do all your own maintenance. It's got a long history to it. It's been around for many years now. I don't have an accurate count on how many are flying, but I recall from an earlier conversation, it's uh, more than 200 airplanes, I believe. So this airplane has got some credential out there in the field. I think it's one that a lot of people would like, but for an airplane that will do duty as a bush airplane, or that will satisfy a lot of your interest in flying and not break the piggy bank, pretty good airplane, I would say. You can find more information about Bushcat by Skyreach, about their U.S. importer Aerosport on bydanjohnson.com.